who uh, spent some time with us in the cardiac cath lab uh, last year after we uh, came through to do lectures. And um, I'll put it up at the end so you can read it in its entirety. But essentially, uh, Jonathan was quoted in Cleveland Magazine. Uh, and uh, thanks to his being in it, they got me in it too. Um, and uh, we're grateful that uh, he spent time with us. And I, I would lay it out there for you right up front that if anybody wants to come spend time with us in the cath lab to see procedures and stuff that we're going to talk about today, uh, let us know. We'll, we'll set something up like Jonathan can come spend a day with us and uh, get to see what we do in real life. It, it brings everything uh, that we talk about today together for you. So, uh, yeah, if you want to be quoted in, 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 the, in the press, um, that's one way to do it. So uh, I'll put that back up at the end of the talk. So uh, today's talk is called Myocardial Infarction and Interventional Cardiology Technologies. By the end of this lecture, uh, you'll understand what all that stuff means, uh, I hope. And I want you to feel free to stop me with questions. Uh, and we'll, we'll try to get through everything uh, in the next hour or so and, and give you time for questions afterwards. We'll get you the slides. So don't necessarily worry about feverishly taking notes. Um, that always winds up being more distracting, I think, to you guys. So. Uh, We'll get you the slides, you'll get all the information, and hopefully they'll all be laid out for you pretty easily. What we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about what a heart attack actually is. What does it mean to have a heart attack? How do we treat them? Uh, what does it mean to be an interventional cardiologist, and what's the state of the art of that technology? Um, we'll talk about some new innovations in that uh, area, uh, and treating atherosclerosis elsewhere in the body. I think Dr. Oringer's lecture earlier this week probably talk to you about the basics of atherosclerosis, so by now I think you'll have a pretty good understanding of that. Uh, and then we'll wrap up by telling you why I think uh, my job is so cool and why you should think about doing what we do. Uh, our learning objectives uh, for today, um, we're going to talk about the mechanism of heart attack, uh, we'll talk to you about what are the treatments for heart attack, uh, and then the concept of reperfusion, which is the principal therapy for, for heart attack. Uh, we'll also talk about three pivotal innovations in the field of interventional cardiology. Um, and then we'll talk about certain specific concepts, angioplasty, stents, restenosis, and local drug delivery. And then at the end, we'll sort of blitz through five new innovative technologies um, that will be changing what we do today. So by the time you guys are cardiologists, um, these will be the mainstay of therapy. So I'll tell you why I became a doctor. Um, and this goes back. A lot of years, I won't tell you how many. Um, when I was uh, about uh, eight or nine years old, uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey, uh, and my friend's dad had a boat, and he took us out uh, to the boat, and we were standing on the dock, um, and then somebody starts yelling out, does anybody know CPR? And you see down at the end of the dock, there's a, a, a kid about your age, and uh, a man slumped on the ground uh, who's clutching his chest. And uh, I remember standing there frozen, not really knowing what to do. My heart was racing, because you knew that the person was in trouble, but uh, I didn't really know what to do. Uh, and we felt kind of helpless. Um, and I remember thinking that day that maybe someday I'll know what to do. And I'm glad to say that that's what I do every day now. The human circulation you guys have learned about, I think. So I will just go through it with you briefly. Um, in the slides, you'll get the YouTube link. That I, I'm not a big fan of YouTube in general, necessarily. Uh, but there's a great video going through the circulation uh, in there. But can somebody describe to me what happens to the blood once it gets into the heart? Where does it go and where does it come back to? Go ahead. It goes from your right atrium down to your right ventricle. It's pumped out through the pulmonary arteries to right. the lungs. It comes back in to your left atrium. Then it goes to your left ventricle and it's pumped through your aorta to the rest of the body. That's exactly right. That's perfect. So uh, basically you have two circulations. One to pump to the lungs, the rest to the pump to the body. Um, and that's really the fundamental first thing that you need to know to understand how the heart works. The heart is basically a pump which has wiring and pipes. And uh, if you were to reduce it down to its essence, that's really what it is. So let's talk about a patient to bring all this into perspective. So the patient I'm going to talk to you about is a patient I took care of about a year ago here. Um, he's a 43-year-old man, which might seem old to you now, but it's not that old, believe me. Um, who uh, has no known medical problems, was taking no medicines. Um, and he's out hiking with his kids uh, during spring break last year. Um, and while he was hiking, he all of a sudden got chest pressure, was short of breath, and
and started sweating profusely. Um, he got dizzy and lightheaded, uh, but was able, with the help of his kids, to walk to his car, um, and then they called 911. The ambulance got there in a few minutes. It, he was hiking in a remote area, but luckily hadn't gotten too far away from the parking lot at this uh, national park. Um, and the ambulance showed up relatively quickly, and they recognized that he was having a heart attack. And they did an EKG, which is, uh, as you know, an electrocardiogram, uh, right there in the parking lot. And they said, this is going to be a heart attack. We need to get him immediately to a, a cardiac catheterization laboratory. And he was flown directly from the parking lot of the national park to our uh, helipad um, and brought to the cath lab. So as the, as the talk goes on, I'll show you how his story uh, evolved. So coronary artery disease, again, same thing. Now, you guys have talked about this with Dr. Oringer, so I've intentionally not put in too many pictures. Um, who can describe to me what, what happens when you have coronary artery disease? Does anybody remember what uh, Dr. Oringer was talking to you about? Sure. I think he said the uh, slack builds up in the artery. Uh -huh. and he closed the artery. That's exactly right. 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 So all kinds of things can happen. But the predominant thing is that as plaque builds up on the artery, um, the artery itself will narrow. Um, so uh, essentially what happens is that you start with a normal vessel here on the left. It looks like a circle if you cut it like a loaf of bread in cross section. As the plaque builds up, uh, I'm not sure which is the laser pointer on here, um, but uh, as the plaque builds up, you see that the artery tries to maintain the, the opening that blood flows through. And it continues to try to do that until it can't and the artery gets narrow. And once the artery gets narrowed with the plaque that's building up on the walls, it can't allow enough blood to flow to feed the heart muscle. And this is what we call coronary artery disease. And this is the typical progression uh, going left to right of, of how coronary artery disease happens over time. And unfortunately, it starts as young as it, at your age. And it continues to happen over time if we don't eat right, exercise, take care of ourselves. Um, and and the, the ultimate problem is what you see on the right, but it starts with this progression as young as age 10 or 12. Yeah. What happens in the regression? Yeah, so this is actually a theory that in 1987, when this paper was published uh, by Glagon, uh, was that you could actually make this process reverse. Now, it turns out that it's a lot easier to make it progress than regress. Uh, and there's very, very little information to explain how we can make these bad plaques get less narrow. The most important therapy would be treating with lowering, lowering your cholesterol with medications. But it's a lot easier to make it get worse than get better. I would say that at best, we can make it stabilize with medications. Uh, if it regresses, it's very minimal that it regresses. Uh, I'm hoping, though, that in our lifetimes, we'll have better medicines to make this go back to normal over time. But right now, we don't have a liquid drain up for the arteries yet that can sort of make these arteries open up as easily. At least not with, with medications. All right, so myocardial infarction. What is myocardial infarction? Right, it's a heart attack. Sorry. So it's relating, my part of it means it's relating to the heart. Uh, infarction is a tissue death due to lack of blood supply, okay? So there, therefore, my part of infarction means death of the heart muscle, which is what happens when you have a heart attack. Um, we, have, we abbreviate everything in medicine, so we call that an MI, or, uh, or a heart attack, basically. Uh, and the diagnosis of MI is made with two out of the following three things. One is you have typical symptoms. The second is that you have an EKG that is consistent with a myocardial infarction. And three is that you have blood tests that show that you've had damage to the heart muscle. So um, when you have a myocardial infarction, what happens is the, the plaque inside, this is what it looks like, really. This is somebody's artery. That's a lot of big mass uh, in here, OK? This is all the cholesterol that's built up inside the artery. The artery is um, the whole thing all the way around. Uh, and this is the plaque. And then all this red, dark stuff is blood plaque, which is formed with that plaque rupturing and totally blocking off the artery. OK? So the symptoms of heart attack, or MI, 
are what we have with our patient, chest pains, uh, particularly right in the middle of the chest. Um, it's usually burning or heavy or squeezing. Um, we'll often hear patients say it's like an elephant was sitting on our chest. Um, it's precipitated usually by exertion or emotional stress. Um, and it's often relieved uh, by nitroglycerin, which dilates the blood vessels, or by resting. That's what we call angina, uh, which is chest pain related to heart uh, lack of blood flow. Um, and that's it's uh, stable when you can make it go away by sitting down. It's unstable when, when it doesn't go away no matter what you do. The other symptoms are shortness of breath, dizziness or lightheadedness, diaphoresis, which is a fancy word for sweating and feeling sort of cold and clammy, um, and pallor or looking pale or like, you know, like a white as a sheet. Yeah. Um. What is it? I thought like something happened in your arm, like your arm gets tingly. That's How a great question. So in some patients, you can rightly point out that this pain in the chest radiates down the arm. And the reason is, is the nerve fibers that innervate the, the heart area uh, also innervate the arm. So you can get this crosstalk between the nerves and you can get what we call referred pain. So you can go down the left arm, the right arm, comes up to the jaw sometimes. I've had patients tell me they thought they had a toothache when in fact they were having a heart attack. Um, some patients will get indigestion or heartburn. Uh, ironically, the, the name is very apropos for some patients. Their, their only symptom is what they think is indigestion, but in fact, it's, it's, a, it's a heart attack. So these different pains can happen, and so if you're taking care of patients who have this problem, you have to be sort of a sensitive to that. Yeah. So they'd have to be like really minor heart attacks and the fetuses, so it's okay. just like, well, Not necessarily. That's the, that's the funny thing is that you don't necessarily have um, a smaller heart attack just because it, it manifests only in your jaw or someplace else. Um, everybody's wired differently. And as, a, as you know, some people have higher pain thresholds. So if pain for one person might be just a nuisance for somebody else. So you have to be kind of sensitive to this. And that's why you need other findings, EKG and the blood test maybe to make the diagnosis. So what happens after you have an MRI? Um, you can have a weakened heart muscle. Remember, if you have dead heart muscle, it's not going to beat properly. It's not going to squeeze blood and pump blood. So you can have congestive heart failure. Uh, you can also have trouble with the heart wiring. You can have arrhythmias, irregular heart rhythms, um, which is why sometimes patients need to get shocked um, out of a bad heart rhythm when they have a heart attack. Um, you can also have uh, sort of the heart attack as the first warning that there's blockages elsewhere elsewhere in the arteries to the brain, to the arteries of the legs, to the kidneys, and other places in the body. So it's usually a warning shot that you have atherosclerosis throughout your body and that you need to treat it systemically. Yeah. What exactly does the shocking do to your heart? It resets the heart's rhythm. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more as we get further on. But when, when, the, when the heart has a heart attack, if the wiring system of the heart is disrupted because there's no blood flow to that area of the heart muscle, you can have the heart go into a chaotic rhythm so it can't beat in a concerted fashion. Uh, and when that happens, you need to reset the whole system. And the way to do that uh, is with electricity. Uh, it's crude but very effective. All right, so let's put it in perspective. Um, heart attack is the number one cause of death in the United States, okay? So if you're looking for an important problem to be part of, this is an important problem. It kills more Americans than anything else. And in terms of cost, we spend $350 billion annually taking care of patients with cardiovascular disease. Um, those of you that are interested in healthcare and policy, it's obviously a big, important area where you can make a huge impact. Um, one in six <coughs> Americans will die from heart disease. Think about that for a second. Um, and then half of the patients who have heart attacks will never make it to the hospital. If you imagine 30 or 40 years ago, the patient that I'm describing to you would have been out there in the woods, basically, and might not have ever even got an ambulance to him. So this is the curve of uh, how many patients have, have heart attack and uh, die from it annually. And you can see that at the tail end, we're starting to see a drop off, and we're actually making headway. Uh, and we're, we're having less deaths from heart disease than ever before. Um, and here's the cost. Um, and you can see the numbers are staggering. Uh, $178 billion for coronary disease alone. And then if you add all these other cardiac diseases that result from it, it's quite an impressive uh, menu. 
Okay, so let's go back to our patient. Um, this guy is 43, he's a young guy, 